from WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odess Gillette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. <music> Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Richard Abercrombie on February 3, 2020. Richard grew up and became a Baha'i in the 60s. He and Joanne Boravica together recorded his story in a book called Crossing the Line, a memoir of race, religion, and change. His story starts with him turning away from the church and becoming a delinquent. He tells the remarkable story of the influences that turned his life around. I asked Richard to tell us the beginning of this remarkable story. I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. I was born in 1945. My spiritual life was that we had to go to Sunday school. If we didn't go to Sunday school, we weren't allowed to do anything else that Sunday. So it was like going swimming to the movies. But if you went to Sunday school or to church, you were allowed to do other things that most people want to do. I maintained that spiritual life until I was around 13 and a half, 14 years old. And then what happened after, at that time, at 13 and a half? Well, because of some experiences and noticing certain things in the community, like the amount of racism that existed toward blacks, and also, one particular incident, when I was at church, I wasn't allowed to go from the Sunday school that was held in the basement up into the church that was held upstairs because I didn't have on my coat. And I was told that I had to have on a coat to go in the church. This was the second largest black church in Greenville. So I went to the car to get my coat that I had left in there, and the car was locked, and my father was in a board meeting, and I was told that I couldn't disturb him. So I went outside and sat on the steps of the church, and I thought, you know, what a ridiculous law that the church had that you couldn't go in the church sanctuary unless you had on a coat. And I just began to think about other ridiculous laws that was not only at the church, but also in society. And at that point in life, I sort of become delinquent in my activities. Now, Richard, before you go there, I do have one question, and that is, you said that one of the reasons that disillusioned you about the church was racism, but if you were in an all-black church, where did racism fall into you being discouraged about the church? Well, it wasn't about that necessarily that particular church, but it was the fact that only blacks were allowed there. Blacks were not allowed into white churches. And I had to pass several white churches on my way to that church. And it was just that whole thing of racism that existed within the church, which was supposed to be the house of God. Right, right. So in other words, Sunday was the most segregated day of the week in the United right. States. Yeah, That's good. It was. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, so continue your story about somehow this disillusionment manifested itself in you becoming delinquent. Is that what you said? That's correct, yes. How did that well, manifest itself? I began skipping classes at school, being late for school, being disobedient to uh, my parents, being disrespectful to my teachers at school as well as my parents and law officials in breaking certain laws, which at times led me to being incarcerated. 
being expelled from school. And that continued for a while until at the age of 15, I was introduced to the Baha'i religion. All right. So, Richard, before you go any further, I want to ask you, I mean, I guess you were a good boy while you were going to church and then you crossed over into being a bad boy after you were disillusioned with the church. Why the extremes? I mean, why didn't you like just be disillusioned with the church but still be a good boy? Well, one thing I thought about was this whole idea about God. I felt that God was like a Santa Claus. And somewhere along the line, people forgot to tell one, some generation forgot to tell the other generation that uh, Santa Claus was just make-believe. And I felt that the same thing had happened about religion and God. Because there were certain things about religion that I found very hard to believe, such as the physical body of Jesus ascending to heaven. And if God was all uh, loving and the most forgiving and the most compassionate, how could he condemn a soul that he created to live in eternity forever and ever and ever? And I knew that heaven couldn't just be up because depending on the time of the day, if at 12 o'clock in the, at noon, you point up as toward heaven. At night, because of the rotation of the earth, you're pointing in an entirely different direction. So certain scientific things and certain things that I was taught in the church to believe just didn't make sense. Hmm. And that was part of the reason I no longer felt this connection with God and the church. However, I didn't completely lose it because I knew in my mind and my heart that there had to be a creator. I knew that the earth was a creation because when you look at the earth as a whole, the way that things grow, the way that the earth revolves around the sun and the different seasons, I knew that there had to be a creator. I just couldn't accept certain things that I was taught about that creator. That, that was the only connection that I maintained, but I didn't necessarily associate it with the God and the religion that I had been taught but I knew that there was a creator. There had to be, because if the earth is a creation, somebody had to create it. Not just the earth, but the whole solar systems and the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. I knew that if a spaceship could travel at a million miles per second in a straight line, and it traveled for a million miles in any direction, it would never come to an end. So those things kind of kept me from becoming a total atheist. Mm -hmm. Now, I had atheist ideas and thoughts, but I never really classified myself as being an atheist. But Richard, what was the change that broke that kept you from being good and instead being a delinquent and cutting school and breaking laws and getting arrested. What was that bond that got broken that kept you from being that way before? The bond of religion and obedience to your parents and obedience to God and to authority. Mm -hmm. I no longer felt that I was bound by those laws. Mm -hmm. Right, right, understood. So I'm speaking with Richard Abercrombie, and we're talking about his memoir called Crossing the Line, which is a memoir of race, religion, and change. 
and Richard was talking about his growing up years. And then, Richard, you said that at the age of 15, something happened. You said you were introduced to the Baha'i faith. How did that happen? Well, I was invited to a birthday party by a, a, a girlfriend of mine. And her father belonged to a particular denomination that they believed. Now, I'm not sure if the, all the people in his denomination believed this, but he believed that there was only one birthday worth celebrating, and that was the birthday of Jesus, which Christians accept as being in December. So he would not allow her to have a birthday party. But there was this white lady who attended, at that time, a black church in Greenville, it was Springfield Baptist Church. She would attend that church on a fairly regular basis. As a matter of fact, I later found out they called it the White Lady Sunday. That was the, the once, I think it was once a month that, that she would attend. And she made friends with Helen, that was the girl's name. And when she found out that Helen could not have a birthday party at her home or any place that her father knew about, she had made friends with Helen and she had asked Helen if she would be willing to babysit her grandkids. So frequently, Helen would go to her house and babysit her grandkids. And now, and, and let's just say Junie, that was her name. Junie was white, of course. And she lived in this white neighborhood. Well, when I was told about the birthday party for Helen, I was given the address. And I walked and I realized that I was entering a white neighborhood. And so I went and knocked on the door and asked if there was the birthday party for Helen there. And they told me yes and invited me in. And I, as I went in, people were seated listening to a man by the name of Bill Tucker. And Bill had a very strong Southern accent. He was a white person. And he was from North Carolina. And, and of course, he had that Southern drawl, you know. And when I realized that this white man was sitting in a room telling black kids about God, I felt that no white man had any business trying to tell black people about God because of the racist views and the racism that permeated the area in which I lived. So mentally and physically, I turned him off. And I can't tell you a word that he said. After I realized that he was trying to tell, tell me about God, I just felt that he had no, no business trying to tell black people about God. So this lady, Junie Faley, she was glowing like a light because she had all of these kids in her home that she shared with her son-in-law and daughter about her religion, which is the Baha'i religion. I couldn't imagine what it was that she was so happy about, you know? So I wondered about that. And then after the meeting was over, then they had the birthday party. They had the cake and ice cream, etc. And I was asked to sign a guest list, and I did. And not knowingly, they, Junie used that guest list to invite people to other what they call firesides, which are informal meetings to tell people about the Baha'i religion. And I would throw them all away. <laughs> I, I just tear, you know, I either tore them up and threw them away or threw them away as they were. And I kept receiving those for several weeks. 
In the meantime, because of an altercation that I had had with one of my teachers, a physical altercation, his wife also taught school there at the same school. She wondered, you know, what, because my other brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm the middle child of eight children. At that time, four of my siblings had attended Sterling, and they were all very studious, very respectful. So this teacher's wondered, you know, how do we... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so, and she somehow found out that in my younger years, I was interested in plays and acting and had done some things at my grammar school. So she reached out to me and asked me if I would be part of this play. I accepted. And during the dress rehearsal, the night of the dress rehearsal, that evening I had received a postcard to come to this Baha'i fireside. And I threw it away. And backstage during the dress rehearsal, I was on one side behind the curtains and everyone else was on the other. That's just what the, the way the stage was set up for that particular scene. And something came over me, a you know, feeling that I'd never had before. And the feeling was I had to go to that Baha'i meeting. Well, I had thrown the postcard away. But I did remember the, the street that it was on. So I told the teacher that was in charge of the play that I had to leave. And she said, you can't leave now because this is the dress rehearsal. You, 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 you know, you, we, you have to stay. You can't leave now. And I told her, I said, I have to leave. I said, but I promise you I will come back. And she, out of disgust, just turned and walked away. And I left to go and find where this Baha'i meeting was. So I'm speaking with Richard Abercrombie, who just published a memoir of his life called Crossing the Line, with the subtitle, A Memoir of Race, Religion, and Change. And so, Richard, what happened when you headed over to the what the Baha'is call a fireside, which is an informal gathering telling us people about the Baha'i faith? Well, I knew where the street was. I remember the street name, and I knew where it was. It wasn't very far from the school. I would imagine maybe half mile, a mile, no more than a mile. And I walked down to Anderson Road. I didn't know whether to go right or left. So I just thought I would go right. So I turned right and I walked down about two blocks and then I saw a bunch of cars parked in front of a house and in the driveway. So I went up and I knocked on the door and asked if there was a Baha'i meeting there. And they said, yes. So I was invited in. I sit down, and this time God sort of had mercy on me. <laughs> that was a black speaker. It was a lady by the name of Eulalia Bobo. Later I found out that she was the sister of Joe Lewis. And the famous, the famous boxer. Yeah. So she was talking, and everything that she was saying made sense. She was talking about the different religions and how all religions came from God. At one time, the messenger of God for mankind was Zoroaster. At one time, it was Krishna. At one time, it was Moses. One time, it was Abraham. One time, it was Jesus. Another time, it was Mohammed. And most recently, it was Baha'u'llah which is an Arabic word, which means glory of God. So I was very impressed by what she was saying and what some of the, the laws were. And I recall that in my world history class, I had read about these other religions and how they 
about each other and some some of the most violent wars had been over religion and yet she was saying that all these religions came from God at different times in man's history. Then I remembered that I had promised the teacher that I would return. And so right after the, her former talk, I left and I ran all the way back to the school. And the lights were out. There were no cars. Everyone was gone. So immediately, I turned around and ran all the way back down to Anderson Road to the shoemaker's house. That was the homeowner's name where this fireside of this informal Baha'i meeting was. And I went back in, and I had many questions for her of things that had bothered me about God and religion. And... All of them, she answered to my satisfaction. It's this thing about heaven and hell. And hell not being a physical place in the center of the earth, but it was a spiritual condition of the soul. And so was heaven. Heaven was a spiritual condition of the soul. And the resurrection of Christ was a spiritual resurrection, not his body ascended into heaven. It was his soul. And I had other such questions, but she answered all of them immediately. I was also impressed that there were white and black adults at this meeting. And after the discussion was over, this elderly white gentleman came up to me and he put his hands on my shoulders and he said, Son, what do you think about this? And I said, so far, I agree with everything that was said. He looked at me so um, passionately in my eyes, and he said, Son, I have been looking for these people all my life. So from that point on, I began attending Baha'i meetings against my parents' wishes. So were your parents the first folks that you t talked to or told them about this Baha'i religion? Well, it sort of came about that I had a part-time job. I cleaned uh, three offices at night, and I was getting home much later because a lot of times there was a Baha'i meeting afterwards, and... I would either attend the Baha'i meeting first and then have to go and take care of the offices that I was under contract to do, or I would do the offices first and then go to a meeting, and sometimes I'd stay late, so I started getting home much later than normal. And my parents wanted to know, you know, what, what was up, and I told them that I was going, you know, that I had been to a Baha'i meeting. And my father wanted to know, what is this? And he began questioning me. And from that point on, every night when I would come home, no matter what time it was, he would get up and get his Bible, which was about eight to 10 inches thick, and come into the kitchen and start reading from the Bible and asking me questions and so forth. And eventually, it began to wear on me about these inquisitions. And I remember one night I got home very late, and I was very quiet, and I came into the house, and my mother usually left dinner for me in the oven, and I opened the oven, and I got my plate out, began to eat, and I heard my father's footsteps coming toward the kitchen. And I thought, oh, God, don't let him come in here and bother me tonight because I was, I was tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some nights I had homework 
that I had to do. So anyway, he sat down with the Bible and he opened it up and he read something from it. And I wasn't really listening to what he was reading. And then he asked me, he said, what do you say about this, what, what he just read? And I began answering his question and listening to it at the same time and realizing that I wasn't aware of the answer to that prior to that, nor did I feel that I was the one answering it. I felt as though someone was speaking through me. Mm. And when I finished, my father took both his hands and closed up the Bible. And I had another brother who had just walked into the kitchen and my father asked him, said, what do you think about that? And my brother said, what can I say? And my father got up and walked out of the room. And from that night on, he never came back into the kitchen with the Bible, giving me these inquisitions. Because he felt as though he could not reach me with the Bible. He was going to have to find something that I believed in and to show me where I was wrong. So he started reading the Baha'i books. And that was the beginning of his so-called downfall. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if he would ask a question from something that he read in the Baha'i books, if I didn't understand it, He'd tell me, call one of your Baha'i friends and ask them. And I would do that. And he would get on the other line without the other person knowing. I knew he was on the other line to listen to the answer. Well, this went on for a short period of time. And then my mother wanted, well, first my father sent my oldest sister to go to a Baha'i meeting to find out what's going on with these Baha'is. He didn't want to go, but he wanted my sister to go and report back. And my sister came back and told him, I found nothing wrong. I enjoyed it, and the people were very friendly, and the discussions were very, very good and informative. After that is, is when he started with the phone calls, asking, asking me to make the phone calls to one of the Baha'is. And my mother was concerned as well, but she wasn't near, near as vocal as my father was. And she said, I want you to invite some of your Baha'i friends to come over to the house. I want to meet them. Well, just prior to my being born, our next door neighbor had a son who, there was one white family that lived in a house in our neighborhood. And the neighbor's son and their daughter, who was white, played together as kids. And he moved away, moved up north for a while. And when he came back years later, he and this young girl started courting secretly and they were caught together and of course at that time there was no such thing as consensual sex between a black man and a white woman it just did not exist and so he was tried and he was eventually electrocuted oh my god so my mother, when, when I invited a couple of the Baha'is to come over, one of them was Eulalia Bobo, and the other one was the son of Junie. She was probably in her 30s at the time, but that was still considered young. And my mother became very concerned because she thought, you're going to get yourself killed by hanging around with these white people, particularly white women. 
So she welcomed you, Layla, but she was very suspicious. My mother had been taught that you feed white people with a long handle spoon, meaning that you don't get too close to them. Uh, you don't you don't get in a position where they can bite you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Right. Right. Yeah. So they knew because at that time my knowledge and understanding and my belief in the Baha'i teachings had grown and they knew that I wasn't going to be turned around. Plus, on top of that, I had school teachers who called my home to talk to my mother to tell them about the changes that they had seen in me so far as school and my, my general behavior. And of course, my parents had recognized some of that themselves. So to move along with the story, Eulalia Bobo felt, she felt that by me being at the age that I was in the situation with my family and all, that it was going to be very difficult for me to remain steadfast in my beliefs with the way that my parents felt. So she began talking to my parents. Now also, the neighborhood that the Bensons lived in was very prejudiced. The neighbors at different times became very vocal um, when they would see black people coming into their neighborhood. And the matter of fact, at that time, any time a black person went to a white per person's house, if they worked in the yard, or if they were the maid or the butler, they always went in the back door. Well, when Eulalia was staying with the Bensons, she always used the front door. And th this was against the norm. So that, that was another reason for their concern. You know, this black lady going in and out of the house all times of the day and night uh, through the front door, and they discovered that she was living with the Bensons and, and wasn't living in, in a maid's quarters or anything like that. She was <laughs> living in the house. Right. So Eulalia and my father began having these discussions. My father is very strong willed and opinionated and so was Eulalia. <laughs> when they would get together and talk, there was sparks flying. And there are many examples that I could give. I'll just give one. I remember one time she was talking with my father and she said, Mr. Abercrombie, I don't see how someone as smart and as intelligent as you are can believe some of the things that are so stupid. Well, I immediately ran from the kitchen because I, I didn't want my father to feel that he had to defend those kind of remarks because I was present. So I hurriedly left. Another time, my father told her, he said, if you would be quiet for five minutes, I could teach you something. And she said, okay, Mr. Abercrombie, I'll be quiet for five minutes and let you say whatever it is you want to say. I have to say, and then you be quiet for five minutes and listen to me. And that's what they did. And after that, they began to have conversations. And this went on for several weeks. And then my father, along with reading some of the Baha'i books, because he was trying to find something in there that he could attack me with, and to show me where this was this was false. And after several weeks, maybe probably maybe more than a month, probably two months, because at first they would stay up all night until it was time for my father to get ready to go to work. And Eulalia would then go upstairs and get her Bible and study on some of the
things that they had talked about to be able to give him a different perspective of what he saw. And so after a while, my father said that he had stayed up all night fighting with the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel won. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was ready to become a Baha'i. But he did not want to sign his cards for two reasons. One, he wanted to wait till my mother was ready. And the other, he wanted to be able to talk to members of his church to try and teach them about the faith. But then finally, he felt that it was time for him to become a Baha'i, whether any of the members from the church were ready to listen or if my mother was ready to become a Baha'i and he became a Baha'i. Yeah, he was the first of my family to accept the faith. And I honestly thought that if ever, if ever at all, my father became a Baha'i, he would be the last in my family to do so. Yet he was the first. Interesting. Interesting. So I'm speaking with Richard Abercrombie. And he's written a memoir called Crossing the Line, a memoir of race, religion, and change. And he's talking about how he ran across the Baha'i faith and how then he had to deal with his father, who was a fundamentalist Christian and opposing Richard's involvement in the faith and how ultimately his father embraced the Baha'i faith. Now, there's a story, Richard, about your friends, when you start introducing the Baha'i faith to your friends, and there's a story about how you had a car and you would, or and your friends sort of made an arrangement on how, okay, if, you know, they wanted to borrow the car, but in order for them to borrow the car, you gave them some conditions. Why don't you tell us about that story? Well, at that time, I had a 34 Ford five-window coupe with a rumble seat. Now, that was a pretty old car, and it was a classic. And many times, they want me to give them a ride. And one person in particular, William Smith, who is known either by the name of uh, Butch or Smitty, I had told him that I would give them a ride if they would go to a Baha'i meeting. And so they consented, he and two of his other friends. I can't remember if Smitty sat in the front of whether he rode in the rumble seat at the, in, the, in the back. A rumble seat is sort of like a trunk and a car opening in reverse that you could sit in and you were actually like in a convertible. So I took them to a Baha'i meeting. And when we got there, they realized that they were in a white neighborhood, just as I had done months earlier. And they were not going to go in because at that time, you did not go, if you were black, you did not go into a white neighborhood after sundown. And it was well after sundown and they weren't going to go in. And I had to coax them and tell them that I had been there many times. I had no problems other than having to listen to some obscenities sometime from the neighbors. I was finally able to coax them. I told them, you know, if, 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 if you don't go in, I'm not taking you back home. <laughs> you, you know, so you have to walk back home. So they finally consented to go in. And when Smitty walked in, he saw this lady that came to the, of, of what they called the White Lady Sunday, which was Junie Faley. He saw her, and then he happened to see one of his mother's best friends, who was Miss Annie Hurd. 
And when he saw them, he felt comfortable. He felt that no harm would come to him because he, he knew two people there. One was white and one was black, and he knew both of them. He was familiar with them. And so he sat down, and he began to listen. And over a period of time, he, after having read some of the books and studied, Smitty became a Baha'i, and he was very staunch Baha'i. And uh, he's still serving the, the Baha'i faith. And, of course, his story is also included in the book. One of the, one of the things my classmates first noticed was, of course, that my behavior had changed. And it was during the fast. I became a Baha'i in December, and the fast starts in March. So it's just been a few months. The Baha'i fast consist of not eating or drinking after the sunrise. And you don't eat or drink until sunset. So it's approximately about 12 hours during the day that you don't eat or drink. And this is for a Baha'i month, which is 19 days. The Baha'i fast occurs right before the new year. The Baha'i New Year. Yeah, right, which is March 21st. And so I was also running track at the same time. And they were wondering, you know, why why aren't you eating? And and I tell them, well, I'm a Baha'i now, and this is during our fasting period. Well, they were thinking, you know, the, 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 Rick has been drinking too much of that wine. Uh, okay. and, or Kool-Aid. And, <laughs> <laughs> and right. so several of my classmates, including Smitty, were wondering, you know, what, what's, what's going on with him? You know, he's, he, he's definitely behaving a lot better, but uh, now he's doing his fasting and, and this and that. So the, the, they they became interested into what what it was that was causing me to change, and of course I would tell them, and I'd invite them to meetings. And within a short period of time, oh, I think it was probably about eleven or twelve of my classmates became Baha'is, and Smitty Smitty being one of them. And so I did interview Smitty some years past i've actually I, I i had two interviews with him and it's just the first interview that i had with him that he tells the very same story that you told from his perspective which is f- f- kind of cute people can find that by going to the archives tab on a baha'i perspective.com and just doing a search on smitty and you should be able to find the interview and it's the first one that i did with him that has that same story so I'm speaking with Richard Abercrombie, author of the memoir, Crossing the Line, a memoir of race, religion, and change. And I guess, Richard, this memoir, it takes you all the way up to the present, or what time of your life does it mostly focus on? Well, it focuses pretty much on my entire life. I'll mention that within a short period of time, all of my siblings that were 15 years of age or older became Baha'i. All of my brothers, my sister, my brother-in-law, my grandmother, my first cousin, two of my father's brothers, and of course, the classmates that I mentioned. I got married a few years after high school, and at that time, Job opportunities were still not great in the South for black men. And a Baha'i friend of mine knew a Baha'i who lived in Michigan, and they wanted to participate in a project where Baha'is of different races would live in the same city and gradually introduce people to the faith particularly in cities where racism was still a big problem to overcome. So 
I was asked to come and visit this couple in Adrian, Michigan, which is about 30 miles from Toledo, Ohio, 30 miles from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and 70 miles from Detroit, a small city. I had experience in janitorial work, so I was going to take care of this man's business and possibly buy it while they moved to one of these southern states to participate in this project sponsored by our National Spiritual Assembly. And that's how I came about moving to Michigan. In Michigan, well, before I started my own business, I was hired at a local Catholic institution that contained everything from Montessori schools up to college. The, there was a, a area in the grammar school and high school. The girls could board there, but they didn't allow boys to board there. And boys were not allowed to attend the high school. The boys could attend up, to, I think, to seventh or eighth grade. So I was employed there for several years. I ran into a different type of racism in the North. It wasn't as blatant as it was in the South, but it still existed. And opportunities, a lot of the racism that was in the North did not prevent you from seeking other opportunities. It still could sting. Eventually, I started my own janitorial service, and it was quite successful for a number of years. I continued serving on um, Baha'i institutions and serving the Baha'i faith. And then after living there for 20 years, I moved back to South Carolina. And the climate between the black and the white races was very different than it was when I left. And uh, I've been able to travel to uh, to Haifa, Israel, which is the um, world center for the Baha'i faith. Uh, I have been on pilgrimage there. A pilgrimage is where you go for nine days. You get to visit the place where Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, was kept in prison. He died a prisoner there uh, and other holy places. And I also was able to visit Christian places like the cave of Elijah, the birthplace where they believed that Christ was born, the place where he was executed, and so forth. And I've been there three times, uh, once as a visitor and twice with my family that became Baha'is as well. Two, two of my children became Baha'i, and my wife became a Baha'i. And it's just been a wonderful experience. Uh, and I've also traveled to India and to Africa. I have told people that if I had not become a Baha'i, I would either have spent my life in prison or I would have been dead. And I strongly be believe that to this day. So I'm speaking with Richard Abercrombie, and we're talking about his memoir that he wrote, Crossing the Line, a memoir of race, religion, and change, and how the Baha'i faith, as he said, saved him from either going to prison or getting killed. So Richard, Crossing the Line, what made you think of that title? for your memoir? What happened was probably, I guess maybe close to 30 years ago, I had began writing this story. And I am not an author. So I was having difficulty getting beyond nine pages. I think it was nine pages. When I was on one of my trips to Haifa, Israel, Kaiser Burns, who was a member of the House of Justice, which is the supreme governing body of, of the Baha'is of the world, he had heard some of my story 
from my sister, who was at the time serving in Haifa, Israel, as an assistant, administrative assistant. Kaiser knew about some of the history of how I became a Baha'i and other members of my family had become a Baha'i. And he said, you should write a book about your story. And I told him that I had started at one time, but I had reached sort of like a standstill. And he said, I want you to come to my office tomorrow and I want to talk to you. And Kaiser Barnes told me, he said, your story could be an inspiration to other people, other young people. He said, you should finish writing your book. I gave it some thought, but I stayed idle for quite some time. And then my son, James Richard Abercrombie Jr., knew a, a person who had published a Baha'i book, a lady by the name of Joanne Borvica. He said, Joanne, he said, you should encourage my father to finish the book. Well, Joanne had already published a book called Light of the Kingdom, which is Baha'i understanding of the Bible. Joanne approached me and mentioned that my son had um, approached her about possibly giving me assistance in finishing the book. I was very delighted to have someone who had published a book to assist me with finishing mine. I don't think my son could have picked a better person because she knows how to dig into situations and things to help the story. And she did just that. She and I laughed, cried, and prayed <laughs> during all the times because a lot of times just retelling stories and bringing back memories of how it was in the 60s and, and some of the things that I encountered, not only from family at first, but also from people who were opposed to blacks and whites being together. And some of, some of them were very dangerous. I, I've been into some situations that, that were life-threatening, uh, and I had to recall a lot of those. Some of them brought back unpleasant memories of some of the things that I endured. And that was after I become a Baha'i. I, I endured more racism and hostility after I became a Baha'i than before. And I had, I had to go through all of that. But, but anyway, she and I spent several times rewriting this story. And so this year, the book came out. My wife had the privilege of visiting you over the Christmas holidays, and you graciously gave her a book that you inscribed for her. And she started reading it on the way home from our trip. And she could hear your voice and your mannerisms and your speech in reading the book. And so that wasn't lost with Joanne's help, which I think gives a credit to Joanne's ability to help you write this book, but not lose the voice of Richard Abercrombie. Yes, well, I think so, too. I, I get my credit for it as well. If you'll notice, the book was dedicated to Kaiser Barnes, my son, James, and Joanne Borovica, because the three of them played a very unique and necessary part in getting the book published, written and published. Well, Richard Abercrombie, author of Crossing the Line, a memoir of race, religion, and change, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I wish you good luck that this book gets wide distribution because it's a story that people will really find inspiring. Thank you so much, Richard. Well, and thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Richard Abercrombie, author of Crossing the Line, 
A Memoir of Race, Religion, and Change. You can find this interview and the link to Richard's book on the website abahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. <music>